Lotus Justice. Verily, verily, my brothers and sisters, those that shall hear shall hear, and those that shall see shall see. Shall, shall see. see. <laughs> yeah, see shall see. I come um, first off saying that I'm going to read uh, the word uh, as to why I'm here. And I'm going to refer to Corinthians 14.3. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. He that prophesieth edifieth the church. Now I bring that forth because I'm here to prophesy to educate the church. Because really what you all don't understand is that the church is the root of all of your evil that is in your, in your daily lives. The word edifieth means to instruct and improve especially in moral and religious knowledge. Uplift to enlighten. And I think that what everyone has come to know in their exposure with the judiciary of the United States, which is not the judiciary of the United States of America, is that there is something heinously wrong. There seems to be a national trend, a national habit, a national conspiracy of the judiciary to not only act with immunity, but impunity. And they are not following the law that we dictated to them that gave them the grant to law to give their branch of the government the power to call themselves the judiciary. What you don't realize is that all that you know and you think is truth. When it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it is a duck. And if the people in the judiciary look as though they're committing treason, they are. If the judiciary looks like they are conspiring and obstructing justice, which are predicated acts of RICO, they are. Whenever they're taking children and taking private, what's called parole evidentiary uh, communications, not recording them, not putting them on the record, and then interpreting the words of children in their own way, then editing those reports to cure and prevent actual claims of molestation and pedophilia, sexual assault, physical assault, from entering the record, that's what they're really doing. So what you're trying to figure out is, is how your judiciary is able to do such things. And the problem that you have is, is uh, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. You don't know what is really happening because you are not learned in the law. You have failed to learn the law because it has been an intentionally obfuscated from your history and you have intentionally been lied to by your government That's right. about what the law is that is governing you. And I can tell you some things right now that they will be proclamations of fact. And everything that I say to be fact, I can prove with either state papers, the annals of Congress, as, histor as historical records, that there's nothing that I'm going to say to you that I cannot produce factual evidence to support what I'm saying. Thank you. I'll wait a moment. I think it's the foot. It's leaning. No, oh, no, down there, friend. You can take it off too, Lotus. If you want, do your walk and do your talk. Yeah. Wow, that was kind of. Just for the record, I did fix it. <laughs> <laughs> so the problem that you have is, is you live in a paradox. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of history of who I am for those of you who don't know of me, and very few of you know me personally. I was born uh, officially a child of the 60s to uh, belligerent, civilly active hippies. <laughs> Both of them went into civil service. 
one in state and one in federal. They rose to the call of Kennedy and made a difference in their government. And I assure you that the death of Kennedy affected them a great deal, the murder of Kennedy. I was raised to question authority, to never take anything at face value. I come from a long line of uh, Roman Catholics. I was baptized Roman Catholic. My family heritage is my mother's side came to this country in the 1600s, in the early 1600s. So I have freeholder sovereign immunity under the law of the crown that created this nation, that gave the legislature the rights of the king to affect law. So I grew up in a politically active family. I've always been politically active when I was younger and in my non-reformed years, I was a Democrat. <laughs> and I actually worked for both the Clinton campaign and the Gore campaign. I then, after Gore lost, worked for the Kerry campaign. I ran seven wards in the central corridor of Columbus, Ohio. I turned seven Republican wards liberal or conservative Democrats. So I turned seven wards that historically had always been Republican and turned them into Democratic wards. Shortly after that, of course, the state had to gerrymander it and remove that ward and move it to the next northern district because I had flipped their ability to control what was happening. When I was in that political arena, I saw gross abuses of due process, there was gross and rampant voter fraud. And what I learned though is, is that both parties conspired to let it happen. Because if you fixed it when the Democrats did it, then the Republicans couldn't use it the next time around. Because what I found out is it wasn't a party of Democrats and Republicans, it was the party of just us versus the rest of the people that we govern. So I had learned basically that political activism, though I was very good at it, in the arena of real public, a real public service, in running campaigns. And you wouldn't believe how many Democrats came to me and said, will you run my statewide campaign next year? And I said, absolutely not. I gave that up because I saw that it was inherently corrupt that it was not in compliance with the law, and it wasn't in compliance with the Constitution that my family helped create and defend since the 1600s. So I decided to become politically active in helping grassroots organizations create a voice, because it was going to be with the established ones, right? Okay. So I went, and I, the first time I did this was with the Occupy movement. That was a very interesting, uh, uh, um, experience for me because what I had discovered is is that the Occupy movement was intended to basically be a Bolshevik revolution of students where they had put provocateurs and uh, in, in co-opted individuals within these, these occupations to promote violent activities in mass with sticks and, and violence. That was actually the original intention of Occupy by the people who tried to control it after it was created. Now, the, the thing that they failed to understand is, is when there was a call to occupy, all the old hippies came in. <laughs> and the old hippies uh, started reinstituting all the kumbaya stuff, right? And so the Bolshevik revolution that had been planned was undermined by the political activism habits of the hippies of the 60s who led the students to understand this is truly what you're supposed to do. So what I also found though in the Occupy movement is that the attorneys themselves were undermining and trying to control the political agenda of the students. And I'm talking about where uh, attorneys would come in and self-appoint uh, themselves the attorneys for the occupation. Well, this ran contra to the purpose of the Occupy movement, which is we are not within the state. We are actually against the systems of state. So you had attorneys that were going and filing permits for these kids to occupy state houses. Well, once you file a permit under the law, under the legal system, I should say law, statute, 
you are, are required to comply with the police power enforcement of the area. So what the attorneys basically did is invited the tyranny of the police to tyrannize the occupations as their legal representatives protecting their unalienable rights. So the attorneys were undermining the organization of this grassroots organization, which I helped fund locally and helped maintain their occupation. So what I came to know is that the attorneys were the ones that were really undermining the republic. And I started to investigate this because I'm a student. I spent many years in college before I actually took a degree and graduated. And so I started trying to figure out how is it the attorneys are doing what they're doing and why, except to control the political agenda of the United States. Because what I had found in my life up until that point is that every time a movement came forth that would change the direction and course of the political arena, somebody came and co-opted it and took it over, and the root of those people that did that were the esquires, the attorneys. Mm -hmm. So I decided then to educate myself and become learned in the law because I wanted to find out where my republic, my country, had gone wrong, was going wrong. So what I decided to do is occupy the courts and to start paying attention to what the attorneys in their uh, sophist construct, meaning where they twist the law for the benefit of whatever person pays them the most money, were doing in the judiciary of my country. And in the course of the Occupy movement, the preponderance of people that we were helping were the homeless. I came to understand that every time the city needed money or there was an election that they needed to fund, they would round up all the homeless people and what we called bond run them. They would give them tickets for misdemeanor offenses that did not or did not allow them to be incarcerated in jail and they would put them in jail, clip them through the courts in a matter of a day or two, force them into special courts called uh, uh, advocacy courts for the disabled and disenfranchised, meaning they sent them to a court where they were presumed to be wards of the state before they were even read their rights. And they were automatically assigned an attorney, yep. an esquire. And you notice they don't ever call them a lawyer. Right. They're not lawyers. If they were lawyers, they would advertise in the L's. They are attorneys. They're well, they can't say they're, they're a lawyer because that would be a not truth in advertising. A lawyer is a PhD with a jurisprudence. It is a degree in philosophy because law is a philosophy. Esquires have a master's in business administration at best. They are glorified bankers. They are not learned in the law. They are not required to be learned in the law. Title 28 says that. The only person that's required to be learned in the law in this nation is a solicitor general. And your current Solicitor General's title is Acting Solicitor General. Now, why would an attorney who is a Solicitor General of this country have the title of Acting? When does someone get the title of Acting? It's when it's in vacancy. Because an attorney cannot occupy the position of Solicitor General because it's actually a seat in the law, and they are attorneys at law. When you're at law, you are in the law. When you're at the house, are you in the house? No. So, an attorney at law is not what you think it is. And yet, what exactly what they are are in the words that you're unwilling to go look at the definitions of. An attorney at law is rooted in the word a torn. The word a torn means to twist. So an attorney at law is one who twists at law. It's a person who twists the law in order to benefit the person that paid him the most to twist it. That is what Aristotle said statutes are for. Okay? So the failures and vacancies and what are happening in the gaps in our society when it comes to the law is because you have a group of men and women who have taken the title of nobility of Esquire and they have been allowed to twist your law since 1812 and they have twisted the law to the benefit of their masters that pay them the most to the point that you don't even recognize it now how can that happen 
if we are operating lawfully. So I'm going to introduce you to two terms so that you can understand where you are versus where you think you are. There's two important terms in law here. One is de, de jure and de facto. Now, many of you may know what this means, but for those who don't, I'm going to read the definition from Black's Law. The word de jure, spelled D-E-J-U-R-E, -E, it means descriptive of a condition in which there has been total compliance in all requirements of law. So the words total and all. You are 100% compliant with the law. So if I'm an agent of the state and I am in 100% compliance with the law and I totally comply with the requirements of the law, I'm de jure. The next meaning that you need to know is de facto. De facto, in fact, means spelled D-E-F-A-C-T-O. In fact, indeed, actually. Okay, that's what it translates to in Latin. The phrase is used to characterize an officer, a government, a past action or a state of affairs which must be accepted for all practical, practical purposes but is illegal or illegitimate. Thus, an office position or status existing under a claim or color of right, color of right, as in color of law. So color of right is color of law. So when they talk about an agent in Title 18, 241, 242 operating in the color of law, they are admitting to you that they are operating de facto by the definition. And let's go further. The color, uh, right or color of law. Uh, in this sense, it is contrary to de jure, which means rightful, legitimate, just, or constitutional. Thus, an officer, king, or government de facto is one who is actually in possession of the office or supreme power, but by usurpation, such as coup, or conspiracy to overthrow, or to levy war, or without lawful title. So, what those two definitions tell you is it's not about whether or not the instrument of law they're sitting in is de jure de facto, but the act of the man within it. And so what those two terms tell you is, is when a judge, judge, which they're truly just administrators, or an agent of the state operating under the color of law violates the Constitution that gave them the grant to occupy that de jure seat, if they act against and in contrary distinction to the Constitution, they are no longer a legitimate agent of state and they are de facto. And it means that they have usurped the state. And uh, so the issue of what we're dealing with here is what John Gentry spoke of. We're not talking about where the laws are vacant. There are vacancies within the laws, but those have, are in, with intent in that the attorneys have conspired to move the law in this direction and to leave this void so that they can rape the rewards of stealing from the people. We don't have an issue with very many laws at all. In fact, I believe that our law is very constitutional. But it's the, it's the bad actors within it. Pardon me. I could point out some uh, laws that are not constitutional very quickly. Someone spoke on it earlier about the family law. It is repugnant to the Constitution by the, by the proclamation of the Declaration of Independence where it says all men are created equal. And anybody who says, well, that's just about the male. The word men is in woman. Okay? So consider women men with more woe. Let's do it that way. Sound good? Let's do it biblically in this respect. Yeshua had one sword that he carried, which is the sword of his father. His mother, sacred mother, had seven. So consider that women carry seven more times the woe than a man. How about that? Does that work for you? Nope. <laughs> so when, our, uh, when we declare that all men are created equal under God, that didn't mean not children. That didn't mean not the infant and the offsprings of mothers and, and fathers. 
So how is it that the family law that has been evolved through the Esquires, bar unions, have been allowed by just declaration that children have no right to a jury, that children have no right, have no protections under the 14th Amendment, that children's substantial rights can be waived by the request of the state bringing a claim where if they seize the child, the state has a pecuniary interest in the seizing of that child. How is it that these individuals have made it so that they can take substantial rights and the unalienable privileges and uh, unalienable substantial rights and the privileges and immunities of the 14th Amendment United States citizen and have made it so that children don't have any of those. Now let's find this out. Do you think if those are taken away from you when you're incarnated into this realm, not birth because I'm not a boat. My body is a vessel, but I'm not a boat. Do you think that if those rights were taken from you at your incarnation in this realm, at that doctor's hospital, that suddenly they turned around and gave you those rights when you turned 18 or 21 or whatever? Do you actually think that they relinquished the presumption that you have substantial rights and the privileges and immunities just because you turned 18? Do you truly believe that? Okay, well, I'm going to give you some statutes here some examples of how that's happened. So let's establish the fact of law that to make the presumption and supposition that a child born in this republic land doesn't have substantial rights or privileges and immunities of, at incarnation is a repugnant construct to our republic constitution. I think we can establish that fact. So why would the esquires need to do that? That's a central question here. And the answer for that is they need to do that because if they can seize the child, they can seize the family. If they can control the rights of the children that are the estates, the, the inheritors of our estates, they can control everything you've put forth for the history of your family from that day forward. Mm -hmm. They can also take that child and indoctrinate that child to their perceptions of what they should be within their states of men and take away your family's right to teach that child the morality from within your own family. That's right. So what it does is allow the state to indoctrinate your child by forcibly making them wards against your will into their state indoctrinated construct. So I'm going to say a couple things here that would be difficult for people to believe. You live in fascism. Mm -hmm. It's pretty right now. They don't wear brown shirts. They usually wear little gold badges and have nice little silver, you know, white uniforms and black pants. That's right. Sometimes they actually do wear the sheriff's uniforms that are brown. But if you don't believe that police powers aren't the same powers used in Nazi Germany to go after children and the asociales in those houses, Way back in Nazi Germany, you're sadly misguided as to what's going on in your country. That's right. Because the Nazis, who were fascists, they were the ones that would seize people without warrant. That's right. They were the ones that would disappear people into the night. The elderly, they're doing that with the elderly. That's right. They're trafficking the elderly. They're, they're going and saying, for the good of this old man, we should put him in an old folks home. You know what that's the intent to do? They seize him as a ward of the court and then they bankrupt his estate and seize all his holdings and steal it from him. That is right. Oh. I work I know. So your government through the courts is doing the same thing that Nazi Germany did during the height of fascism. And I'm gonna tell you how it's the same people because everybody needs to remember that Germany was the, was the prevailing republic at the time. Germany was the prevailing republic at the time in this realm, the world that we know. And everything that Hitler did was legal, but not lawful according to the republic laws that existed. You know how he did that? They had bar unions in Germany too. The esquires of Germany allowed the atonement, the twisting of the law for whoever was paying them the most, particularly the banking industrialists that needed Germany to fail, they actually 
allowed the law of the German Republic to allow things that were, republic, that were repugnant to it, such as the ability to seize people and disappear them at night, put them in work camps, kill them outright. Just disappear people. And I think we know children are disappearing. Yes. Yep. How many children are, have disappeared in this holocaust of fascism that the esquires for the bar union have affected to the judiciary in our republic today? There is a holocaust upon you, and it is fascism. And I will tell you by definition why that is the case. The word fascism comes from the word fascist, fascio, as in that in your body, the fascia. The fascia of your body is an example. It's the thing that wraps all the muscles, the connective tissue. Fascism is when all aspects of the government are connected by one singular tissue, one singular union. And you have that in the Esquires for the Bar Unions, who now occupy every branch of your government and undermine every branch of your government through their backroom deals and ex partes and obfuscations and lies and overt acts of sedition and treason upon the record. Now, I'm not saying that every esquire for the bar union is a bad person because they're not. There are very good people in these unions who actually are being subjected to even worse tyranny than we are because when they try to do right, they get run out of their income. They get they, some of them get, uh, uh, their children get kidnapped in order to coerce them to comply with the rules of the union. There's evidence that they are even being murdered whenever they go against the whatever the masters of this union have edicted them to do. So just like there's not every citizen is a bad person or a good person, we got a mixture of both. There's bad esquires, there's good esquires. There's bad cops, there's good cops. You only know them by their deeds. You've been told how to know. You know them by their deeds. That you witness, that you witness, not hearsay, that you can testify and bear witness to. So what you have here, though, is an evident existence of some secret hand, some hidden hand that is manipulating the, the, the union that connects all the branches of your government that are supposed to have separation of powers in order to uh, guarantee a Republican form of government. But what you have is you have, in, you have an agreement of interbranch comity. Comity, which means you're going to cooperate for a mutually beneficial situation. Now, the concept of the independent branches of government agreeing to conspire to operate in comedy to the point where they don't prosecute judges who openly and willfully, and not just judges, prosecuting attorneys, social workers, CPS workers, sheriff, cops, any agent of state that is affecting sedition or treason by uh, undermining the laws of the United States, if they are unwilling and have agreed ex parte to look the other way to violations of Title 18, 241, and 242, except when they are overt, it means that you have a, the people that are running the branches of government that are supposed to be the checks and balances in your government that are conspiring to undermine those checks and balances to allow conspiracy against substantial rights to reign in this country. So you basically are in coup. You are in a coup d'etat. You are in a fascist coup d'etat of your government. And the root of that conspiracy and coup d'etat is within the monopolies of the bar unions. And let's speak to the monopolies of the bar unions. The monopolies of the bar unions are unlawful pursuant to the, anti, the Sherman Antitrust Act and a variety of, of laws. Those monopolies are not allowed to reign. Why are the bar unions allowed to monopolize the judiciary, the only branch of government that's the only a judicial branch that's afforded to the American people at this time, how are they allowed to monopolize it to the point that they do repugnant acts and never are held accountable for the crimes? How is that happening? Well, if the legislators have agreed not to 
bring them and impugn them by impeachment or even put them in, in uh, prison, or the military doesn't come in and, and, and uh, charge them with sedition and treason, which, according to the prevailing law that I've read, is the sole uh, jurisdiction of the military. So you all people looking to say, well, they're affecting sedition and treason. Guess who's supposed to be fixing that? Your military. Your military. So your military is failing you if judges are openly committing acts of sedition to anybody. I don't care if it's a cop. If you have people conspiring in a county and you've got cops, sheriffs, prosecuting attorneys and sheriffs and judges who are conspiring to traffic children through Title IV, the military is supposed to come in and arrest them if there's prima facie evidence upon the record and charge them and if found guilty, hang them for treason and sedition. They're not doing that, are they? Probably because in my mind, we wouldn't have very many courts still running in this country. Because this is a pervasive problem. And when it's a pervasive problem, it means that it has a pervasive root. So here I am, 30-something, totally uh, disillusioned with what I thought my government was. And, what, and finding that it wasn't what I thought it was in its application to the people. So I started educating myself on the law. And I started attending classes by this brilliant man uh, who was uh, an expert in my mind on admiralty law and the concurrent jurisdictions of admiralty law and common law within a special uh, jurisdiction of the United States. And he explained to me and showed me that we're not under common law. We're not under law of equity. We're under admiralty law. We're under the law of war. We're under the law of commerce being protected by military occupation. And I go, how did that happen? He says, well, remember the Civil War? Well, we're still under the Lieber Code. Has anyone here read the Lieber Code? It was the law implemented after the Civil War code that says, we're going to allow the skirmish to, we're going to occupy you and set up these rules of, of combatants within the people themselves. And we're going to do this to make sure that commerce continues. You are still under that rule. You are still under the Lieber Code. You are still under military jurisdiction. You are still under articles of war. And guess what? We're all deemed belligerents in that act. And that is especially poignant when you have people run around calling you a sovereign citizen. Has anyone heard this? Has anyone been professed to be this when you talk about the Constitution? Now, the term sovereign citizen is not defined, but it usually involves that you actually talk about Constitution. So apparently now if you're an American citizen, quote unquote, and you actually aver that we have a constitution that needs to be followed, you are tagged with the label of sovereign citizen. Well, guess what? The term sovereign citizen, according to the FBI, is a domestic terrorist. A domestic terrorist. So you have the FBI who has defined people who aver that they have constitutional rights and fight judicial treason and sedition and crimes against the American people, you're a domestic terrorist. So if that doesn't explain to you that your own government considers you a belligerent to what they perceive as their occupation of their land, that's not our precept of law, is it? So I start looking into the things that this man is talking about. He introduces me to this thing called the Titles of Nobility Amendment. I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, well, there's a 13th Title of Nobility Amendment that was brought forth in the early 1800s, and they say it wasn't passed, but people say it was passed. I said, really? So I start researching it. My mother and I, I do the research, and I'll go research the Annals of Congress. I research this in depth. And I'd say, hey, here's a reference for a book. Let's see if we can get this book, and I'll peruse it and find it. So everything that I learned, I actually, except one, actually possessed the books for. They're in my control. And in the, as far as the, the statutes of Virginia and republication that affirm its passage, I have two copies. One of them stamped by a mason in a mason library. So I have a stamped mason copy of the statutes of the laws of Virginia as republished 
post the War of 1812, where they say we have to republish these because the actual documentation was lost during the war. And in that republication, they affirmed that they passed the Titles of Nobility Amendment. And if you understand the history of the Titles of Nobility Amendment, and if you read my writ of conspiracy, which I put in the District of Columbia in a variety of places in 2014, I lawfully proved that the, the, that the 13th Amendment for the Titles of Nobility was lawfully ratified in 1809. And what they had done in that, they had, uh, John Quincy Adams is an interesting actor here, he's the Secretary of State at the time, when they go to do the roll call for the vote from the states on the amendment, because it had been ratified within the federal construct, they were waiting on the answers from the states. And he goes through and he lists the states that have brought forth answers, but he acts like Virginia is not a state that exists. He literally omits Virginia in the list of states in the roll call. He doesn't say we haven't heard from them. He doesn't say they said no. He doesn't say they say yes. He just acts like Virginia is not even a state of the union. And there is a, that's an intentional obfuscation because they acted as though Virginia wasn't a state. And Virginia's passage of that makes that three quarters of the states ratifying that lawfully in the conventions of the de jure states. So in 1809, the Titus Nobility Amendment, which specifically talk about emoluments, the emolument of titles of nobility, it specifically speaks to that was passed. And I shall read that to you. And by the way, I can prove that passage. It's been sitting on the record since uh, 2014 in a writ of conspiracy. I have copies of that. And for those that are listening, the, that exhibit in that filing, but it was filed in uh, it was Exhibit 3 in case number 114, CV is in civil, 01631, initials K is in Kevin, B is in boy, J is in John, that's not his name, but those are the initials, and that's with the District Court of the District of Columbia, it was filed in uh, 9-26-2014. That exhibit was removed from the filing. You cannot get the writ of conspiracy except from me <laughs> or from a Dropbox. And I got it because the bankruptcy court, the bankruptcy court sent me a certified copy. You wouldn't even know that, there, that that's been proven up on the record because once again they're trying to obfuscate it. And it's proven by state papers. Nothing I made up, state papers that are in publication and they're in the annals of history. Okay? So let's speak to the emoluments clause first because this is a really big uh, uh, topic today uh, in that uh, Trump is being sued by people who have accepted emoluments saying that he's accepted emoluments. <laughs> Think about that, folks. So, uh, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 8 of the United States Constitution. It prohibits the federal government from granting titles of nobility and restricts members of the government from receiving gifts, emoluments, offices or titles from foreign states without the consent thereof, blah, blah, blah. Well, what people don't know about the emoluments clause in the Constitution is that's the second time Congress prohibited that. It was first brought up, I believe, in the Northwest Ordinance. Emoluments, that was the second time in a lawful document du jour that the governance of our country forbid the acceptance of emoluments, specifically titles of nobility. Now you have to understand what a title of nobility is. And in order to do that, you have to understand the evolution of law and the philosophy of law. People who hold titles of nobility, they serve more than one master. They serve the Pope, the Vatican, and the Queen, and international banking conglomeration corporations. They do not serve the people. They serve foreign states. That is why in the founding of our country, we said people who hold titles of nobility were not allowed in our republic construct because we don't believe that men should serve more than one master. They only serve one master and that is the creator of all. We don't believe in false Elohims. We certainly don't follow kings and we certainly don't follow the false vicar of Christ in the Pope. 
So the title of Zobelium monuments was specifically targeted to the servants who do the dirty work for those reprobate constructs of governance that think that they hold the titles of people's lands, flesh, and can traffic you as slaves, feudal, and vassal. Come on, that's right. So titles of nobility have a purpose in law that is antithetical to the preservation of our republic construct because they serve somebody other than us and who we serve the creator of all, by our law that is. So in the 13th Amendment that was passed lawfully, it says thus, and this is from the actual language from uh, the Virginia State Papers, and I am quoting from, for those who are historical nuts, I am quoting from the revised codes of the laws of Virginia. Again, I own this book. My, my mother and I control this book. We have it in our possession and can produce it as evidence if anyone cared to call us and challenge what I am saying lawfully, such as a title nobility, Esquire. Laws of Virginia, a collection of all such acts in the General Assembly of a public and, per and permanent nature and are now in force with a general index to which the affixed the Constitution of the United States, the Declaration of Rights, and the Constitution of Virginia are included. Published pursuant to an act of the General Assembly entitled An Act Provided for the Republication of the Laws of the Commonwealth, passed March 12, 1819. This is from Volume 1. It is published by Richmond, printed by Thomas Ritchie, the printer for the Commonwealth, in 1819. And in this republication where they reaffirmed the laws of Virginia that were enacted, Article 13 says, If any citizen of the United States shall accept, claim, receive, or retain any title of nobility or honor, or shall, without the consent of Congress, accept and retain, that's not big C Congress, that's little C Congress. Distinction there. Accept yep. and retain any present pension, listen, present pension, office, or emolument, such as a title ability, of any kind whatsoever from an emperor, king, prince, or foreign power, such person shall cease to be a citizen of the United States and shall be incapable of holding any office of trust or profit under them or either of them. Now, if you all know the law in any way, shape, or form, you understand that there is no penalty upon a statute, it's unenforceable. Up until the passage of the Tona, there was no penalty for taking a title of nobility. So we'd already noticed you once and said you couldn't have an emolument of a title of nobility in the Northwest Ordinance. Then we gave you the second notice in the Constitution, and we brought the hammer down when we passed the Tona and brought the default and said, if you do that, we now know the penalty and shall avert it. You are not a citizen of the United States anymore. You are not a United States citizen anymore. You can't hold a position of trust or power in the United States or either of them, meaning in the states united or the United States combined in their federal compact. So explain to me, how is it possible because an esquire is a title nobility by the king's precedent? They still give the title of esquire to people through kings in the king's precedence. So how is someone who has accepted and calls himself an esquire holding positions of power and trust within the United States? Because we're 90% of the Congress is them. I mean, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's pretty darn close. Your entire executive branch won't even probably fart in the wind without consulting one of them. The DOJ is 100% them. So you have all your branches of government that have been inundated with foreign agents. Agents that are not authorized pursuant to our de jure law to hold positions of power or trust in this country. So how does that happen and how is it that we've been obfuscated and lied to and why? The reason for that is a few things that I need to, uh, to bring forth. When we founded this country, a lot of the people whose families came here were actually from nobility. 
but they gave up their titles and nobility to become part of a dual republic society because they understood what happens when you have absolute power. It corrupts absolutely. We decided to recreate the constructs of government that not, no one had ever seen before, and we removed those abilities of power to corrupt absolutely. We gave the king granted the power of the, uh, to uh, the legislature to affect laws. Literally, this is an edict from the King of England at the time who gave the rights of the king to the legislature. Our dual, repu our dual republic uh, advocates that go come together and, and in a dual unanimity pass our laws. Before that, only the king could. So we sat and created instruments where groups of men effected the actions that used to once be in the powers of a select few. Because we believe that men in groups would act righteously in basic construct, that the few bad men in the group would be overruled by the preponderance of the righteous men. So we thought that that would do the trick. Well, the problem with that is that if in those institutions you now allow foreign agents to occupy them, you've completely undone everything that we had hoped to do in the preservation of our republic, in the prevention of absolute power corrupting absolutely. Because if you have one union controlling all three branches of government and tyrannizing the fourth branch of government, the American people, with their police powers, then they have cooed your country. And speaking on police powers, this is a fact of law, statute. And you can find this if you look, at least in Ohio, I think it's section 302 under police powers. Police powers, if you can find anybody, if anybody can find where the word police powers is in the Constitution, I would like to see it. Does anyone know the word police powers in the Constitution? Do you know where police powers come from? Well, if you read, uh, let's say, Ohio jurisprudence on police powers, they admit that police powers are an extra constitutional invention of the judiciary. Now, in my mind, in this case, since they've expanded, expanded their powers versus extended it, they, it means unconstitutional. So let's reword this. Police powers are an unconstitutional invention of the judiciary which means the judiciary stepped outside the Constitution to give themselves an army. The police powers are a standing army for the judiciary, which is a cooing agent, it's a cooed agent of the bar union. So the bar union, as foreign agents, have a standing army in the entirety of the United States. And that standing army has supplanted the highest ministerial officer in the counties, the sheriff. The sheriff now is controlled by the esquires and has abdicated his power to the police powers as the private invention of the, of the judiciary because they needed an army to effect their coup. Is it starting to make sense to you all now? I'm going to. I'm going to let people ruminate on that one for a while. <laughs> so now let's get to where it really gets dicey. How is it that we have foreign agents with titles nobility running our government? Well, here's how. There's a, yes, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> There's a thing called the Civilly Mortis Declaration. This is actually a feudal law construct. And it goes like this. If I were to walk into a court, oh wait, let's do it this way. If I were Jesus, and I were to be brought into a court against my will, and there sits the Pharisees, and there sits Caesar, and I say, neither of you are my judge. I am not subject to the law of your realm. When you say that, it's a civilly mortis declaration and feudal law. I'm pretty sure they got the rules on how to declare a civilly mortis estate from Yeshua. Because as far as I know, he's the first one to ever do it. I don't know. I don't know. Okay? So when Yeshua went to Pontius Pilate and said, You aren't my God. 
I have a kingdom greater than yours. You are not my judge. You don't know my father. He made all these civilly mortis declarations where he declared himself not subject to the prevailing law of the realm, the Roman Empire, and the Pharisees. He made a civilly mortis declaration. And what is supposed to happen when you make that declaration is your estates, not your shadows, your estates are your holdings out there, but your shadows are personal, close to you. Your personal shadows are not to be seized. Your estates out there are to be given to the law of the realm, such as Rome, but you're supposed to be provided for and therefore after exempt from the civil magistrate. When you make a civilly mortis declaration, you are exempt by feudal law from the jurisdiction of the civil magistrate. Who goes before a civil magistrate every day? Everybody with a traffic ticket? Everybody with a, quote, criminal cause of action? Those aren't criminal causes of action. If you look in your civil procedures for most states, it'll say all causes are civil. All causes in this nation are of a civil matter. All. And they're all brought forth by the magistrate of the Roman civil form. That's where the civil procedures come from. Again, if anybody can find the jurisdiction of civil law in the Constitution, I'd like to see it. It doesn't exist. It's a foreign form of law. It's a Roman form of law that existed at the time of Christ. And we, in the Tona Declaration, made a civilly mortis declaration. The United States of America, in the United States Declaration, said, your agents of law may not have positions of power or trust in our realm. We're not subject to the law of your realm. At that time, we basically declared the United States civilly mortis, not subject to the prevailing law of the world at the time, the realm at the time. That's the feudal law, the monarchical law, the ecclesiastic law, and the Roman civil form. And yet here we are under it again. Here we are under it again. And we were then required, pursuant to the feudal law, unfortunately, because of the law of the time, ours, we're ahead of the time here, right? So in 18-whatever, we made a civilly mortis declaration saying that the keepers of the law of the realm are not allowed in our law. We're not subject to your law. They didn't have any laws to uh, tell us what to do when it came to large estates of men that were the entire continent all the way up to the Louisiana Purchase. So what they did is we followed the feudal law and the trusteeship of our estates was given back to the esquires. We were forced by feudal law at the time, though we declared them corrupt because they followed more than one master. We declared them not, not keepers of our law. We were required, required by the law of the realm at the time to surrender our estates to the trusteeship of those appointed by the existing law of the realm to manage our estates. Manage them as trustees, not as real agents of the republic, as trustees, but they can't tell you that because then you know that they're not really, you're not really subject to their jurisdiction and they can't defraud you. They can't defraud you. So what you have is, is your government is your governance. They are a trusteeship with a fiduciary duty to manage your estates. And you're not supposed to be subject to the magistrate, the civil magistrate, unless you violate major laws, the main three laws of our realm. Do no harm to others, do not disturb the public peace, and do not disturb the public trust. You're not supposed to be subject to the magistrate. You're supposed to only be subject to the three laws of our realm. And your states aren't supposed to be defrauded. They're not supposed to be mismanaged in a bankruptcy. They're not supposed to steal money out of your coffers. They're not supposed to, to, to defraud claims against your estates to route out the substance of the people again. So they basically obfuscated the existence of the Tona so that you wouldn't, you wouldn't understand that your government is not your government. They're merely foreign trusteeships 
You're being managed by international trusts. Your judiciary is under the color of law because it's not in our law. It's in their law. And they have a fiduciary duty, though, to not do things repugnant to our law or to abuse our estates and shadows. And so you're wondering, well, how did we get back to getting under the civil magistrate form? Well, it's all about civil form, right? Civil form is contract law. All laws are in the nature of what is called proviso. Well, I'll read what that is. P-R-O-V-I-S-O. It means in a condition attached to an agreement. Everything in your life is in the nature of proviso when it comes to how you deal with your government. Your government is under contract as trustees to operate in a particular manner as your fiduciary. When they violate that contract, guess what? They're de facto illegitimate and it's a false fraudulent claim upon your estate. Everything you do is in the nature of contract. Even in the circumstances of Title IV, the states have agreed to the contract of the federal government with its mandates under Title IV. They are required by that contract to comply with the mandates of that, and in doing that, when they do it, we will give their acts full faith and credit. Means we'll pay for the actions. We'll pay for the incarceration. We'll pay the claims against our states. If you follow our faith, keep that in mind, if you follow our faith. When they don't follow our faith, they're not supposed to get our credit. When they don't do things in compliance with the mandates of the federal statutes, they're not supposed to get our credit, folks. And those are, by the way, the Full Faith and Credit Act as it applies to the judiciary are under Title 28, 1738 for actions in general commerce and in Title 28, 1738A specifically when it comes to children. So, if there's a Title IV mandate that the state judiciary is repugnantly ignoring, then every bond they issue on those acts or every claim in those acts are not in compliance with the full faith and credit mandate. They're not supposed to get paid in their fiduciary capacity. It's very simple, people. You're in contract with your government and you don't even know it. And that's why you think that you're just going around doing your duty, you're doing what you're supposed to do, and bam, suddenly you find yourself the object of a cause of action that bankrupts you. And you know why? In those circumstances, if they're violating the law, it's because they have failed in their fiduciary duty to protect your estates and instead have decided to defraud them and embezzle them for their own personal benefit and gain. So the reason why a bar union would be pervasively, or the bar unions, or the esquires in general, even in the federal construct sitting in the District of Columbia, which is not part of the United States, that houses the corporation, the United States. But the United States, I should say, the United Estates are not the United States Corporation. See, they, they, they play with words so you don't know what they're talking about. So what I've established is now we have two constitutions, really, right? Because there's a constitution that ends with this tona that you've never read. That's your de jure constitution. Guess what? That's the constitution for the United States of America. The constitution they write on now is the constitution of the United States. The United States is a corporation, folks. It's a corporation. It's the bylaws of the corporation that are acting as your trustees in a fiduciary capacity, and they're obligated to follow the laws, surely, that they themselves write, and especially that we told them they had to, or else they're not supposed to get paid for what they do. They're not supposed to be able to write bonds that don't comply with the mandates of the statutes they themselves wrote. That would be a fraud. That would be a failure of fiduciary duty. That would be a conspiracy with the intent to fail in fiduciary duty. So now you know 
why attorneys are acting in one way and you think they should be acting in another. Because what you're doing is, is you are being governed by foreign agents that are operating in a law different than the republic law that you think they're supposed to be operating under. Completely separate system of law, completely separate rules and forms, and that's why there's, you're confused. Because you're thinking one thing, you're thinking your government is one thing when it's exactly something else. Now, everybody in the world, as far as I can tell, has been told this lie. Very few people know the truth. And those would be that unseen hidden hand who have manipulated this obfuscation of the law. Now, why would they want to get us back into civil form? And how? Well, let's say I told you everything of a contract nature. Does anyone here understand that the birth certificate is a negotiable instrument and a contract? Do you all understand that? No? Let's put it this way. If I were to put my thumbprint on a piece of paper in the common law, is that a signature on a contract? Yes. In common law, I don't need my signature to put my thumbprint as an approval. If I put the footprint of a child on a document, that's the child's acquiescence without his consent that he's in contract. So the way that they have obfuscated the, for the prohibition against putting our children in this republic under civil magistrate rules is by engaging your children in contract from the minute they are incarnated into this land by putting their footprint, which strangely is called a soul plate. It's called the soul plate. The footprint on that birth certificate is called a soul plate. And if you use the twisting of the words, I think it means S-O-U-L plate, not S-O-L-E plate. And that instrument creates your little all capital sus K instrument, the all capital fiction, which is actually an instrument of trust for the child. The attorney set up a trust account. They set up the trust for the child's estate that's in Sustake and set aside that we're supposed to be provided for and they're supposed to manage in full faith and credit as a fiduciary agent. But what they've done instead is they've used that instrument to traffic your children, to sell them as merchandise proper. So the attorneys have engaged every child in contract surreptitiously against the mother's will and the father's consent as an arbiter and a fiduciary agent from the incarnation when they walk on this earth. And you know why they do that? This is the best part. In common law and in the law, the feudal law at the time, in order for a man or a woman to inherit her lineal consanguinity estate, means your blood estate, you had to put your foot on the land proper. Yet, yeah, if you've seen this in pirate movies, they'll go, where are you going, son? I'm going to claim my inheritance. You know what he's doing? He's going to go to set his foot on the land. Now, if I put your foot on a soul plate, which is deemed a commercial contract instrument, before you put your foot on the land, I have interfered with your inheritance. I am now the trustee and the arbiter of your estate and your lineal consanguinity inheritance. And I can then be the trustee, which we were required to do. So they're in complete compliance with the feudal law at the time in that they are operating in the interest of the child purportedly having created a trust in his name by a true negotiable instrument that creates a Susta KV trust. The United States citizen, all capital U, which is a thing. It's a thing. And if you research probate child law in, uh, I can bring forth student primers that attorneys are given in their college education, which discloses that children are brought as probated instruments as things in rem and quasi rem actions. Children are treated as things, as tangible commodities that can be trafficked in probate. That is an admission in their student primers. REM, they're treated, in REM actions means actions in things.
quasi-rim means kind of. It looks like rem, but we're kind of making presumptions that it may not be rem, quasi. But your children are treated as things. And that's why in family law, they say they have no rights because things don't have substantial rights. Things do have privilege and immunities though, so it didn't even make sense when they say that. Things have privileges and immunities. Corporations have privileges and immunities. The real flesh and blood man has substantial rights. That's why you're confused about civil rights versus substantial and unalienable rights. Wrap it up. So what you have here, folks, is you have an obfuscation of the law, which has allowed you to be misled into who you're being governed by and the function and the purpose of what they do. They are supposed to, even in the law that's here, supposed to be managing our estates and not raiding them. But there's no instrument of law right now that's holding those people to the law except as a fiduciary agent. And so everyone here has an idea of how to fix this. Well, first off, it's real simple when it comes to Title IV. Remove the control and the auditing of the CPSs to the federal instrument. Make CPS a federal agency under the same mandates of Title IV as it is under Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare, treated as Social Security claims. Put them under the federal jurisdiction and make those states comply with the mandates because as it is right now, they're being allowed to uh, control it all by themselves and write a blank check under the constructs of the Rucker-Feldman Doctrine, which, by the way, is the second 13th Amendment. There's three of them. There's three. And each one of those amendments creates a different instrument of trust. The Rucker-Feldman Doctrine was, is the almost exact same language as the second 13th Amendment passed during the de facto era of the Civil War that said that the federal government could not enact any laws interfering with the domestic institutions of the states to define slavery and peonage. By the way, that was passed unanimously in the federal instrument 20 days before the Civil War was out. So you explain to me how if in the federal construct every state agreed that the South could define who was a slave and a peon, why we were alerted into believing that the South believed in slavery and the North did it 20 days later. It's an implied trust contract. It's an implied trust to the states to control our estates and hereditaments of our children on the local level. And now it's being oppressed upon us as the Rucker-Feldman Doctrine, which can be proven by uh, plotting, in my mind, as disclosed in the Journal of National Association of Administrative Law. This is Volume 6, 17, or Issue 2, Article 10, on 10-15-1997. And I'll end with this. It says, the possible application of the Rooker-Feldman Doctrine to state agency's decision. This is from the Seventh Circuit opinion in Van Harken versus the City of Chicago. And I'll just read the conclusion, because this is, this is revealing enough. They, this is a... Uh, 20, I think, 15-page document. Conclusion. Although the Rucker-Feldman Doctrine has never been directly applied to a decision by a state agency, that is dependent of a state agency court, the, option, the opinion of the Seventh Circuit in Van Harken expands, expands the possibility. Remember, expansion is unconstitutional. Extension is not. You may extend a grant of law. You may not expand it. That is a constitutional mandate. So they're saying they want to expand the possible application of that doctrine given to the right circumstances. If the doctrine is applied, states could set up a system of review for their agencies wherein the agency's decisions are not reviewable by any federal court other than the United States Supreme Court. This is 1997, folks. 1997. A state could, for example, require that administrative adjudications of paternity and a child support order be registered with the clerk of the court and be accorded the same judicial effect as a judicial decision. So here you have a Seventh Circuit opinion that the, uh, the CPS people should be given the power of the judiciary to effect orders onto the clerk. And that says, goes on further, in practical terms, this would ensure that only state courts could review such agency decisions, thereby removing your right to due process to have the federal compact and contract of Title IV mandates imposed upon the states. So your judiciary in 1997 was planning to take an amendment to the Constitution you didn't even know existed that was passed in Congress, the second 13th Amendment, to plan and plot 
to make it so that the state agencies, that people who have never been elected into office, quote unquote, if they're elected, are given the power of a judge and they can put orders into the court with the same effect of a judge and those orders are not reviewable past Supreme Courts of the states. Now, if that is a conspiracy to undermine our republic laws put forth by a circuit court, I don't know what is because that's exactly what they're doing right now in the case with my godson that I'm fighting. And mind you, it doesn't matter if you overcome the limitations of that Rucker-Feldman doctrine, they still avert. So I gotta cut it off. Yeah. So I wanna tell you all one last thing. Do not marvel if the world does hate you when you fight these reprobates. Thank you.